This is lecture 6 in BBSP 710. As its name implies, today we're discussing basic summary statistics, mean, median, things like that. Hopefully a lot of this will be familiar to many of you, but if nothing else, I'll be describing how you can calculate these things in R and so forth. So as you'll recall, in any type of statistics, our goal is to describe and possibly make inferences about a population of interest. Um, say we want to find the effect of a drug on adult subjects or the, effe the effect of some type of toxin on rats or whatever the case may be. Usually we can't examine the entire population so we take a sample and we hope that our sample will be representative of the population. So, some terminology to start. First of all, a parameter is a value describing a population. The average number of children in an American family and average plant growth or something like that. It's some fixed value. In principle, we could find every single family in the United States and calculate the average number of children across all these families and have the exact number. That number is fixed and will not change. We we'll always tell people have more children, but if we said that the average at a specific day at a specific time, that's some fixed numbers that won't change. And in general, it's unknown. I mean, in principle, we could calculate this in practice. It would be prohibitively expensive at best and probably completely impossible because there's simply no way that you could act accurately contact every single family in the country. So, except in very rare cases where we can examine the entire population, it's unknown, it's going to be the thing that we try to estimate. And a statistic is an estimate of a parameter based on a sample, and it's going to vary from sample to sample, but the good thing is that we can measure it. That if we survey 300 household, U.S. households and find they have 2.1 children on average, then 2.1 would be a statistic. Obviously, it's not the same as the true population parameter, but we hope that it's going to be fairly close. So, here's an example of, here's, or here's a little graphic to illustrate this concept, that a sample is, uh, the statistic is based on a sample that's a small subset of a population. We hope that this sample is representative of the population. The value from the sample is called a statistic, and the value from the population is called a parameter. And some additional terminology. Let's discuss the difference between categorical and quantitative data. Categorical data is when observations are classified into one to several groups or categories, sometimes known as factor variables in R and other places, for example, gender, ethnicity, country of residence. In these cases, there's not some sort of numeric value for gender or ethnicity. It's either male or female, or ethnicity would be like white, black, Hispanic, Asian, something like that. It's when there's a series of po different possible categories. Quantitative is a numeric variable, blood pressure, age, salary, things like that. And within categorical data, there are several different types of categorical data. Dichotomous categorical data is when there's two possible outcomes, male, female, Democrat, Republican, pass, fail, things like that. You're either in one category or the other. Ordinal is when there's two outcomes and an inherent ordering. If you ask people to rate their pain relief on a scale from none, small, moderate, or complete, or disagree, neutral, agree, basically everyone would agree that small is less than complete or moderate is less than complete. There's a natural ordering to the data. The nominal categorical data is when there's more than two outcomes and no obvious ordering. For example, ethnicity, country of origin, things like that, there's no obvious ways to order. So, now I'm going to provide an example of some of the summary statistics of interest. This is from a former student 
from when I used to teach Biostatistics 610, the, where she was measuring the amount of urea excreted in her liver cell samples. And I'll put this data set on Sakai, and you can download it and calculate some of these statistics as well if you want. So one way or another, the data set looks something like this if you load it in Excel. Like you said, you can download it from Sakai yourself if you want to look at it. So to load the data into R, you can use the following commands. You can just use read.csv as we discussed in the previous lecture. And then I do this command that says attach urea data. Because this spreadsheet has only one column called urea, and if I type urea, it gives me that data. So what does this attach command do? Hopefully the next slide will make that a little clearer. Attach command allows you to reference the columns of urea data without using a dollar sign. If I just read in urea data and don't attach it and I type urea, I get an error saying that it's not found. You have to do what I described in the earlier lecture where you go urea data, dollar sign urea, and then it gives me that data. But if I attach it, then I can just type urea and I don't have to do urea data, dollar sign urea. That can save you some typing sometimes. It's not essential, but it can reduce, you know, this mainly reduce the number of keystrokes that you have to do. Well, the first statistic that we'll discuss is the sample mean. I'm sure all of you have heard of this at least some point in your life. That's mathematical notation that says to calculate the mean. You just add everything together and divide by the number of things in your sample. That's your sample mean. And it's worth pointing out there's a difference between the sample mean and the population mean that if you could count the number of children in every single family in the U.S., that would be the population mean. The statistic on the previous slide is the sample mean since it's presumably based on a smaller sample. We hope the sample mean is a good approximation to the population mean. Most of the time, for the purpose of this class and life in general, I'll just talk about the mean and won't specify that it's the sample mean, but you should keep in the back of your head that it's the sample mean that we're talking about most of the time. Oh, to compute the mean in R, you <clears throat> there's two ways you can do it. In principle, you can just manually add all of the variables or manually add all the items in the data together and divide by the number of items. I do that here just for the sake of illustration. I get a mean of about 35. But obviously that's going to be very cumbersome if you have a data set that's at all large. Even with 27 data points, that was pretty annoying. The easier way to calculate the mean in R is simply to use the command called mean. If you say mean urea, you see I get exactly the same mean when I calculate it manually, but it's significantly less painful. And the next statistic that we'll discuss is the median. Hopefully you're familiar with. It's kind of like the middle number in the data. Here's a little Dilbert comic illustrating that the boss guy obviously doesn't understand what the median is, because the median, by definition, is the number where half the data is below the median and half the data is above the median. So the median is kind of the middle number of the data. There's 27 observations in this data set. So if I sort the data from smallest to largest, which you can do in R using the command called sort, then you take the data point that's exactly in the middle in the sorted data. Since there's 27 observations, the middle observation would be observation 14 in this case. So in this case, the median would be 34.3 as I highlighted here. In general, if there's an odd number of observations, the median is just the middle number. If there's an even number, then you take the two middle values and, and add them together and divide by two. 
it's because there's no exact middle number if there's an even number of observations. If you go from 1 to 5, then 3 is exactly in the middle, but if you go from 1 to 6, then 3 and 4 are equally close to the middle, so you just average observations 3 and 4. Quick little R note that the sort command in R sorts the data from smallest to largest. If you ever need to do to sort the data from largest to smallest, then you can do sort URI and say decreasing equals true, and that'll sort you the data from largest to smallest. So to compute the median in R, the command, surprisingly enough, is called median. They say median urea. I get 34.3, exactly the same median that I got when I computed it manually in the earlier slide. And as a little aside here, one concept in statistics that's considered to be fairly important is the concept of robustness. The statistic is said to be robust if it's not influenced by extreme values. That the mean is not robust because extreme values can have a large impact on the mean. The median is robust because extreme values generally don't have much impact on the median. So for example, if your data is reasonably symmetric, then the mean and the median will be nearly identical. Here, the number of small observations and the number of large observations are about the same. So the mean and the median will be approximately equal to one another. If your data set is skewed, on the other hand, which means most of your observations are smaller, we have a small number of observations that are much larger than the bulk of the observations. That'll skew the mean upward, but the median will stay approximately the same. So in this case, the mean will be larger than the median. Oh, in general, if a data set has a heavy right tail, as we saw in the previous figure, it's said to be right skewed. In that case, the mean will be larger than the median. If a data set has a heavy left tail, then it's said to be left skewed. In those cases, the mean will be less than the median. The next statistic that we'll discuss are quantiles. And in general, you say the X percent quantile of a data set the point at which x percent of the data are smaller. For example, 25 percent of the data is smaller than the 25 percent quantile, or and 75 percent of the data will be smaller than the 75 percent quantile. Different programs may compute them slightly differently, but that's the basic idea. And oftentimes in statistics, the 25% and 75% quantiles are known as the first quartile and the third quartile. To compute quantiles in R, then you can use the quantile command. Again, very surprising. The, just to, to illustrate it, I sorted the urea data again. About 25% of the data is less than the two observations on the top row, and about 75% of the data is less than the two observations on the bottom row. So the 25% quantile should be around those two highlighted observations, and we see that it is. Likewise, 75% quantile, we would hope, would be about halfway in between the two observations on the bottom row, which is precisely what we see. And sometimes people will use like minimum, maximum, median, and first and third quartile to summarize the data, and this is often called the five number summary, and it's handy sometimes. It can help you determine if your distribution is skewed and if there's any extreme values. Well, here's an example of a five number summary in R. You can compute it using either the quantile command or the summary command. I usually use the summary command because it gives you the mean as well as the median, but if you don't care about the mean, you can just use the quantile command with the default parameters and it will give you 
the five number summary. Another statistic you should be aware of is the inner quartile range, which is defined to be the difference between the third quartile and the first quartile. You can think of it as uh, it kind of measures the spread around the median. It's like the median in quantiles themselves. It's robust to extreme values, and by definition, 50% of the data always lies within the interquartile range. For example, for the urea data, the interquartile range is going to be the difference between the 75% quantile, third quartile, and the first quartile, so about 7.3 in this case. One final statistic that we're going to discuss today is the standard deviation. You may or may not be familiar with this, but the way you calculate the standard deviation is you take the mean, then you take the difference between each observation and the mean, square it, divide by the number of observations minus one, and then take the square root of all that. Now, if you've never seen this before, you're probably wondering why on earth anybody would care about this. Like I said, it's a strange formula and not particularly intuitive. It mainly gets used because it has some nice mathematical properties that we'll discuss later on, but if you've never seen this before, I'll briefly discuss some of the questions that people have about this formula. And so why do we square the differences? Well, if you just took the raw difference between each observation and the mean, it's easy to show mathematically that if you take the sum of that, it's always equal to zero, so that's not going to work. But why do we use squares rather than absolute values? Well, the short answer is that if you use absolute values, then you have a function that's not differentiable, and you run into all kinds of mathematical problems downstream. You really don't want to know the details, I promise. Mm, but for the time being, suffice to say that if you square that if you square the differences, it'll produce these nice mathematical properties that I'll describe later. The next question is why do we divide by n minus one instead of n? The short answer is that if you divide by n, it turns out the estimate's slightly biased. You end up with a standard deviation that's too small. In general, you, it's better to overestimate than underestimate the amount of variance in your data, so you divide by n minus 1. For large data sets, it makes very little difference anyway. To compute the standard deviation in R, the command is SD, you can say SD urea, you get a standard deviation of about 4.87 in this case. So a few things to keep in mind about standard deviation is it measures dispersion around the mean, like the interquartile range. It's always non-negative, it has the same units as the mean. Once again, it's not robust against extreme values. You have a few outliers, just like a few outliers can make the mean much larger, a few outliers can make the standard deviation much larger as well. And you may prefer to use median or inner quartile range when the data is badly skewed or you have an ex few, a few extreme values, but in practice, mean and standard deviation are much more commonly used. The things to remember from today's lecture is that you can attempt to estimate unknown parameters using statistics that are based on a sample from a larger population, and we also make the, distinct, the distinction between categorical and quantitative data, and there's various types of categorical data. Mean and median are used to estimate the center of a data set in a certain sense, interquartile range and standard deviation measure the amount of dispersion in a data set. Mean and interquartile range are resistant to extreme values, whereas mean and standard deviation are not. R commands to remember today. Attach allows you to reference the columns of the data frame without typing the name of the data frame each time. Sort lets you sort data. 
mean, median, quantile, and SD. You ca will calculate the mean, median, quantiles, and standard deviation of the data respectively. And the summary command in R will produce a five-number summary plus the mean.